uh, even though Plato is incredibly cr critical of democracies, it's doubtful that he would have the freedom and the opportunity to express the, uh, the wonderful ideas he did express if he wasn't in that kind of society, okay? Um, so Plato's ideal of justice, uh, first off, uh, I've used the word ideal, and I need to address the ambiguity of the term. So when we use the word ideal, we often think of something that is um, to be aspiring after, right? And uh, that's probably a helpful way to think of it. Um, but Plato, in his theory of forms, he had the idea that the foundation for our reality were what I'd like to call archetypes. Please zip close the outside door because we have heat. We want to keep the heat inside here. All right, so, um, so I'll try to remember to say this, that the, when, I, when I refer to the things that are the foundation of reality, I'll try to remember to use the word archetype. So Plato thought that there was an archetype of justice. And this archetype of justice made possible the many different particular manifestations of justice that could be in the world. And the main place that he saw justice manifesting itself was in the character of a person but it could also manifest itself in the character of an institution. Now today, the way we speak, we typically use the word justice to talk about institutions. The way John Rawls puts it in the theory of justice is he says, justice is the first virtue of institutions, right? And it's also the highest praise. So to say of something that it is just, of an institution, is to give it the highest praise that we can give. Now, in the day that Plato was writing, and the topic in the Republic, which is the, the text that I'm honing in on here, the discussion starts with an argument about what justice really is. And in the first book of the Republic, there's a battle between basically two positions. Um, the position that's carried by Thrasymachos, who was a sophist at the time, he was, he was an actually existing person, um, and he took the position that justice was strength or power, right? And it's something like might makes right. And he was really thinking at, the, at, the, at a time when this was, this was a viable conception of justice. Uh, Plato, uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle really pushed the notion of justice into a very moral direction. Whereas prior to that, it more had the connotation of the heroic society that the Greeks came out of. And it meant something more along the lines that Thrasymachos was arguing, which is that it was a kind of greatness and power. Now, they wanted to say that true greatness and power was morally informed. So the, 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 this long book, this long dialogue, starts with an argument, two sides of the question, what is justice? One was justice is strength. The other said, Socrates, justice is goodness. This is the first book. And this gets, this gets developed and challenged, right? So two of Plato's actual <laughs> brothers, Glaucon and Adiamantus, challenge Socrates. They say, you know, you defeated Thrasymachos there. He showed that he, some, his position was weak, but we're not convinced. And they deepen uh, the, cha the, the position that Thrasymachos had. And uh, Glaucon produced the idea of the Ring of Gyges. He said, what if people were invisible? And he means invisibility in a very special way, I think. Um, he means, what if no one ever knew the bad things that you did? What if when you did bad things, they could never know that you did the bad things, and they could only see the good things you did, right? Um, what if you were invisible from criticism, in another sense? Right? Um, you could get into all kinds of mischief, and no one would ever know. And the thought experiment was, who wouldn't do that? <coughs> Who, given the power to escape negative criticism, wouldn't do all manner of things to gratify themselves? Which goes back to the notion that justice is a kind of strength, power, right? The ruling virtue, justice, was about having power. And power didn't apologize, right? 
Um, Adiamantus came and added to that. He said, well, not only um, do we really, is there a real force to this idea that justice is power, but he, he says, look at the way we educate our children. Right? We tell them to do things that are advantageous, that have power accrue to them. We tell them to avoid you know, looking bad and, and so forth. I'm not uh, at, at being terribly accurate here, but this is the gist of what he said. Uh, so that's where the, the, the Republic begins. Uh, this is the second book now. And then uh, Socrates goes and starts constructing what is called the ideal city in speech. Now, a note for you all, that's something of a scholarly note. In, a, in answering the question of what justice is and what the ideal society is, uh, Plato, through the mouthpiece of Socrates, makes it clear that he... Is that Roy? Yeah. Oh, man. He wants to come in and see Man, how the hell are you? It's so nice to see you. I haven't seen you in forever. He's building the, the ideal city in speech, and he says, look, this is in speech. I know this isn't a fact. I know this isn't the reality, right? But the idea is that we put it in speech, and then we aspire in our actions. Right, to realize that thing which we now show is possible. Okay, so that's the exercise, to articulate what would stand to us to be the best place to be, the best environment. And uh, so I say that, and now I'm gonna like jump over a whole bunch of what actually takes place right, in the text, okay? Because I can't give you the whole text. Um, uh, and there's this place in chapter 4 where a very important little thing gets developed. Where so Socrates, this is Plato speaking through Socrates, gives the essence of what um, justice is. And so in order to give that essence, I have to give you the, the, the material to, uh, you know, to assemble so you can see the, the thing. And so earlier on he had talked about how there are different parts to the soul. Um, um, much earlier he gave the myth that said that uh, we come out of the earth, right, um, and we're made of stuff, right, and what we do is we, is we can't see the stuff we're made out of, so we have to test our metals, okay, but the, the metals that we're composed of is the base metals of bronze and iron, the finer metal of silver, and the finest metal of gold. And he basically says that uh, as your metal is, so you are. And it is the task of the city to bring out what you are, to, as it were, realize the potentials of your, of your metal, right, of what you're made of. And um, so he sets it up so there are three basic classes that accord to these metals. The gold class is the ruler, the people who are meant to rule. The silver are the warriors. And the bronze and iron are the workers. Most of the people are bronze and iron. A fewer of the people are silver and gold. And the silver and gold separate themselves. Okay. Now, Plato is thinking here and he realizes that there's this thing in the soul where there's conflict. And he argues that conflict means that not only are there, there are these different metals, but every soul has different parts. And he points out that there are basically three parts. There is the part that desires, there is the part that feels, and there is the part that thinks. And he argues that justice is doing your work, each part doing its proper work. So there's justice of the parts, and then there's a justice of the whole, which he thinks of as harmony. When each individual part does their proper work, the whole can be said to be just. But now the essence of this, the essence of virtue itself, is what makes this happen, is what makes each thing do its part and the soul achieve harmony. And he says the essence of it is self-mastery. Self-mastery is you making you do what you will to do. So I want to give an example to kind of show um, 
what this what, what this means. And my example will be um, a negative case, and the negative case will illuminate the positive idea. Okay. Um, so let's say you say to yourself that you want to lose some weight, and as a general rule, you lay down for yourself. You say you will not have ice cream, okay, before you go to bed, okay, and you set that self as a you set yourself up for a rule because you know you tend to do this, and you have to not do this if you're going to succeed at losing some weight, okay. So you have dinner at six o'clock, and your bad habit has been that when the Simpsons come on, you sit down and have ice cream. Now, Socrates is known to have had the view that knowledge was virtue. And there's a problem with this view, because if knowledge is virtue, then you can't explain why anyone would ever act contrary to their knowledge. And unfortunately, people act contrary to their knowledge all the fucking time. It's a sad thing about us humans. We are beautiful and powerful, but in some ways we are pathetic. Okay? So you've had your dinner. You know your rule. But 11 o'clock clump comes around. And like a zombie, you find yourself before the icebox <laughs> choosing between Ben and Jerry's and Hagen dazs Oh, there's nothing zombie like about this. Oh, well. <laughs> now, and you know what it is? The flavor of ice cream is intensified by the amount of milk sugar. Oh, yes. The more fat content, the more milk fat, the more it tastes good. Okay. So you should only buy ice cream you don't like. Well, that would be well, if you want to lose weight, if you want to have fun, you know, if you want to please yourself, you know. So the question then is, well, what is actually leading you to the icebox? Okay, it's not your reason. Desire. It's not your reason because you, you know, you know, you know what you've chosen. There's no defect of reason here. You know, as Socrates had said, if someone acts contrary to their knowledge, it's because they don't truly know. But here, there is no gap of knowledge. It's, 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 it's untenable to say you didn't know what you had just said you would do. Right? So the only way you can explain it is that either the spirit, the feeling part, or the, the appetite, the desiring part, is in control of the soul. So what self-mastery amounts to um, uh, is that reason, the part that has the tools to make decisions, has to also be in control of the behavior, of the execution of the soul. So self-mastery is when the different parts of the soul act in alliance or in accordance to the dictates of reason. And so Plato goes into some more things. He says that there has to be a friendship between the thinking part and the feeling part. And this friendship, which he thinks is natural, okay, I'll say a few more things. I don't want to get into too much detail, but the appetite is non-rational, okay? The thinking part is purely rational, and the feeling part, he thinks, is composite. It has a part that's rational and a part that's irrational. And so how part of that goes is he says that the feeling part can understand reasons, even though it might not be able to produce them. Okay? And so um, um, the feeling part, though, you can think of it, uh, the way I think of it is the head, the heart, and the gut. Right? <laughs> What you need is a friendship between the head and the heart. Because if you have that friendship, the heart will compel the other parts to get in line. You see? So reason has a kind of natural deficiency. And ever since Plato, there's been a great discourse developing what that means. Aristotle coined the frame, the, the, the phrase, the, the, sorry, the term acrasia. Acrasia. And acrasia means weakness of will. Right? Which is a little bit different than the phrase that I keep saying, doing that, the term incontinence. 
right? You're incontinent when you right, use the bathroom at the wrong times, right? Well, think of acrasia as being the psychological, um, you know, corollary to incontinence. Right? So acrasia, or weakness of will, is when you don't have self-mastery, okay? All right, so Plato put out this grand ideal of self-mastery, that virtue, in its essence, was you being able to do what you actually desire, not in the sense of your appetite's desire, but reason's desire. What the soul, in its consideration of what's right and wrong, what's uh, uh, profitable and unprofitable, what is wise and what is unwise, it makes determinations. Then the ability for you to stick to those determinations, that's virtue. That's the essence of it, right? Okay. So the dialogue goes on. This, is, this happens in book four. Other things are developed that are quite important. Uh, he develops, he brings the ideal city to its fullest description. He starts talking about other things. Uh, in book seven, he gives um, the simile of the line uh, and the allegory of the cave, which are some high points in philosophical allegories, you know, and uh, really wonderful stuff. Um, but what I want to get into after this now is the next book, book eight, where he starts actually talking about real existing uh, regimes, societies. And the basic idea is this. You have an ideal city and then you have the ideal person. And the point that he's um, making here, that he's been developing throughout the book, is that you can't really have truly virtuous people in answer to Adiamantus and Glaucon and the challenges that they brought forward. You can't truly have virtuous people until you have virtuous societies. Okay? So, um, and as you have um, corruption in a society, you get corruption in individuals. And so, what he does in book eight is he goes from the ideal culture, which he just developed in, the, in, in, in this city and speech, right? And the ideal person, the philosopher king, okay? Who is the best product of this culture. Um, he, he, sets, he has a story where he goes from aristocracy, which is what he calls that, rule of the best. That's what the term means if you break it up into its parts. And he, he, he develops um, five different cultures and five different people. So you have aristocracies, you have timocracies, you have oligarchy, you have democracy, and then you have tyranny, okay? And let me just remind you what's happening in the soul. So in an aristocracy, you have the different parts of the soul are well-ordered, and reason rules, and the heart follows the dictates of reason and has a very close friendship with reason, and the appetite is well controlled by the two higher parts of the soul, and the person conducts himself in, accord, in, in almost perfect accordance with what the laws are as reason discerns them. Then you have a decay, and you have, in every stage of decay, a loss of virtue, a loss of the power of reason, and the chain of the soul sees dominance develop in lower and lower places of the soul. So the first stage then is for there to be a loss of reason. And in the, in the democratic regime, honor rules because the heart now is in control. Okay? And then, I don't want to say too much about that. Um, just because I think the real useful out, um, critiques are the next three. So I'm going to talk about the next three I'm going to develop it, right? Um, the next thing is oligarchy. And oligarchy is a place where you have the rule of appetite. But what's interesting here is that he makes a distinction. Plato makes a distinction. He says, and this is not new in the book. Earlier on, in, in the early part, when he just started talking about the ideal city, uh, Socrates starts and he says that the ideal city will be very, uh, I'm just using this word, he doesn't say this, but Spartan. 
it'll be minimal. Um, and he gets objected to very early, and he says, okay, I'll make another suit. But right there, a distinction was made between what's necessary and what's luxurious. And, we'll, and here in Book 8, he returns to that distinction again. And so he says, the oligarch, the appetite rules, but it's the appetite that is a disciplined appetite. And it's an appetite that makes a distinction between necessary desires and unnecessary desires. So the oligarch is someone who seems to have reason because they are able to effectively pursue necessary desires. And what the oligarch wants to do more than anything is to see um, what he believes to be necessity rule. And for him, money is the great necessity. All right, I'm going to come back to him. I just want to get the all three out and then I'll return. The Democrat now is the person who is ruled by their appetite as well, but they have lost the distinction between what is necessary and what is unnecessary. Okay. The tyrant now is the last person and is at the end of the devolution from the ideal order of the soul to what is really the most debauched order of the soul. Excuse me. The tyrant doesn't care about distinctions. The tyrant might be made aware that there are necessary and unnecessary desires, but the problem with the tyrant is the tyrant doesn't give a damn. The tyrant um, is the person most wedded to power and will take any means to gratify themselves. Uh, and this extends into acquiring and uh, amassing power and the pleasures that flow from having power. Um, okay, so you have uh, three different forms of rule, different societies, and they're all ruled by appetite. Okay? So Plato, um, in the larger structure of his Republic, he separated the Republic into two halves. The Guardians, who he um, determined would live communistically. And this is extremely important because he said that one of the worst things that could befall people who are gifted is for them to be confused about what is truly valuable. And the things that are truly valuable are not of this world. Now money is always expressed in tokens of the world. And so he set it up so that no one among the guardians would even be allowed to touch money. <laughs> he said all of their needs would be taken care of. They would spend all of their time training and exercising. And they would have nothing but a lust for winning. And not winning just for the sake of winning, but winning because it would be for them the realization of their highest ends, the um, development of their potential and um, you know, the expression of their being. So he took the people who were most talented and most uh, spirited, right, and he kept them away from money making and from um, what he thought of as the base activities of life. Now this, in large, matches what Plato experienced. Plato was an aristocratic son. He was wealthy, he was from, you know, he, he, he had, um, he could trace himself back to the um, early Greek kings from, two, from both lines of his parentage, right? His uh, grand uncle was the poet Solon, the lawgiver of Athens, one of the great lawgivers of Athens. Um, he was incredibly privileged, right? And, um, and so in his imagination, I think he rightly um, said that the people who are talented should have a privileged environment. But for him, privilege did not mean sitting on your ass 
and eating a lot of food and you know just being lazy no privilege meant you got to be challenged in the deepest realms of your soul to bring forth all of what you're able to do so he would have these people live in kind of a military encampment you know the honor of them being guardians was that they would be challenged all the time <laughs> And so they had to compete for everything. If you wanted to um, have sex, you had to win in an athletic competition. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you wanted to, um, uh, you know, have a job. So there's that, a lot of athletic competition. Okay, every day. Okay, every day. So you said it was. So. All right, so uh, I'm getting maybe off course here, but um, so this is part of the ideal for him. So the point, the, the point about that is that that's the ideal society. In the real societies, we have an incredible confusion of that. And in the oligarchs society, right, in fact, he thought the best people were the people in, who, who made the most money, who were clever enough to make money. Now this is like... This is thoroughly confused for Plato, right? Um, making money doesn't show your intelligence. It shows your compromise, right? I mean, the best people devote themselves to non-material things. Um, the allegory of the cave in Book 7, where he has people coming out of a cave and going into the light, um, that signifies an idea that the, the, the soul you know, the, the, the thing that is most you, oh, look at this, the hell. Oh, great to see you. Well, I, you know, okay. Let me stop your flow. Uh, too late. Um, <laughs> too late? These are like people that I admire and love, and it's so, it's such a honor to have them come out. We were talking about competition, too. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so, so it's so it's it's a confusion. All right, the, uh, you have the oligarchic culture, you have the oligarchic person. Um, so the oligarchic culture. Um, wh one of the things that Plato points out in his critique is that when you have an oligarchy, there will be a monetary requirement for you to engage in politics. So the way it was in his ideal society was they had this incredible regime of tests for you to be in the guard, to remain in the guardianship, to be among the warrior class. Out of the warrior class, they would pick the rulers. The rulers would be um, not only great <coughs> athletes, because Plato had this prejudice that the, the athleticism and, 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 and scholarship went hand in hand, that all of the flourishing of the soul kind of went together. Uh, so you have one of the earliest articulations of the scholar-athlete ideal. Um, but he would be picking the uh, philosopher kings out of the warrior class. And they would be the ones who excelled at language, at, um, he didn't have logic then, he called it dialectic, and math. Math was, there was a, a, um, a above the school that Plato actually taught at, there was um, a plaque that said none could enter unless they um, knew geometry. Huh. You know? So geometry was their logic, if you will. and he insisted that there had to be mathematical rigor. And so the philosopher king was going to be someone who engaged in these kinds of pursuits. In order for them to rule the people, to be part of politics, they had to be the smartest of the smart. Right? Now contrast that with the oligarchs. In order to be in the political system in the oligarchic city, you had to have enough money. Great mathematician, Master of, of mental and, and, and intellectual arts, money maker. I don't know. Okay, so banker, banker, money maker. Is that again? Banker, banker, money maker. Um, okay, so he also says of this culture that um, he has this uh, little description of the oligarch needing to, although he has this appearance of of um, wholesomeness and goodness, he talks about him sneaking away and going somewhere else to engage in things that were shameful. 
right? So there's this thing about the oligarch that he recognizes that the appetites have to be disciplined. So he recognizes the notion of necessary appetites, of necessary desires. Um, but he himself nurtures um, vice. And this is important for understanding the devolution to the lower form of tyranny. Um, so Plato <coughs> characterizes oligarchy as not terribly bad. And indeed, the time when he lived, most of the actual regimes, oligarchy was the most common form of rule, where you had a few people who ruled, and the notion of rule was organized around power. So sometimes people describe oligarchy as not necessarily the rule of money, but the rule of power, a powerful few. Um, he makes it overt in his articulation in the Republic that it's money, and the money requirement is an important thing to understand. Okay, a democracy then is the next level of culture and person that he criticizes. And the Democrat is um, the son of the oligarch. And he sees a consequence coming out of the um, inconstancy of the oligarch. Someone who advocated seeming good and disciplining yourself so you can be a money maker, but engaged in funny business to the side, right? Um, and he thinks that this produced the Democrat, who tends to then not really believe in the truth, right? And so he tends to be a relativist. And he talks about how democratic regimes are the most beautiful regimes, because all different opinions are welcomed and encouraged. And there is this beautiful and dizzying um, uh, diversity. And he talks about how the Democrat in his education spends times with who, for the short of it, are lotus eaters, right? And so he becomes someone who is not able to make a distinction between what is right and wrong, what is necessary and what is unnecessary, because he's so enamored in embracing everybody. Um, and he says this is the principle of democracy, and for all of its beauty, and attractions, the great danger of democracy is that it becomes, as it were, the petri dish out of which tyranny arises. And so um, his criticism of democracy then is that it's too permissive, and that it doesn't make distinctions where distinctions ought to be made, and that it produces people who tend to be relativistic and inconstant, right? And the worst criticism is it is open to being co-opted and taken over by the worst kinds of characters. And this is what he says genetically happens, that out of the democracy comes the tyrant. And the tyrant is a nightmare, literally. The tyrant is like a bad dream come true. Someone who promises um, the gratification of all of your desires, right? But what he actually brings is death, okay? And he makes explicit in the Republic, that one of the things that the tyrant does is he engages in war. Because when you engage in war, you force the people to back you, regardless of what you actually do for them. Okay? And it's a perfect manner as well for you to send your dissenting opponents off to die. Okay? And Plato discusses this. Please go read Book 8 of the Republic and read it slowly and read it multiple times. It's funny. There's lots of parts that are a little weird, and you'll laugh at him. He's an old man who's really moralistic, and he's judgmental. And you'll laugh at Plato. I do all the time. But I don't think his wisdom and insight can be challenged. I think the man is brilliant, and I think a lot of the points make a hell of a lot of sense. But the great warning that he gives, it's incredibly prophetic, because it's true. And, it is, and he wrote this all so long ago, but history has given us instance over instance where this happens. And, you know, there's some obviousness here. Plato was writing with the um, information of history, informing him. He tells these wonderful allegories, and these philosophical stories that he wants you to think comes from his experience with the form of the good, um, his vision of the truth. But frankly, in my view, it comes from his, him being an educated person who's learned from history. 
and learn from the world about him. Um, so the tyrant, the culture of tyranny is a culture of permissiveness um, and death. It invites, it gives you the promise of gratifying everything, which is first of all impossible. No one, you should never believe something that can't be done. And it can't be done that everyone can get everything they want. It can't happen. So anyone who tells you that has to be lying. So the tyrant promises that, and the tyrant delivers death. Okay? So that's the talk, and, and, and what I want, the essence of it is self-mastery says that you have to be committed to what you discover to be the truth. And you have to organize your soul so you can act in accordance to what you discern, what you discover. And who knows what you can discover, right? So the ideal that Plato puts forward is something that most of us can't reach, can't meet, frankly, okay? Because we might find out that what is actually true is something that's really un inhuman. You know, uh, Hannah Arendt, I love her. She wrote a book called The Human Condition. And in the preface to that book, she talks about Sputnik and how it, the book came out in 1958. Sputnik went up in 57. And she says, we're on the cusp now of leaving Earth. So shouldn't we figure out what it is to be a human? <laughs> right? And in the same manner, right, we have this respect for truth. But we have to appreciate that the truth might be beyond us. It might be more than we're equal to live in, right? We have to be humble enough to just recognize that. But then we have to also be equal to this challenge. What we discern that is true and that is possible for us, we have to discipline ourselves to achieve. And that's not a pretty thing. That might mean, you know, being really harsh to yourself at a certain level. And I don't know if we all want to be Platonists in that sense. Right? But so that's Plato's view, and I hope it makes some sense, and I hope it can be in, empowering for the for our movement. And um, maybe I'll, I have more to say, but I'll, I'd like to, to have a question and answer, and then have a, just an open discussion.